Syracuse of Emory University coined a new term all the way back in 2002 to describe a certain aspect of our mental health. That word is languishing. But nobody paid any attention to that word and to his research until late in 2020 and early 2021 when lots of people began experiencing what Keyes had described. They were looking for a word to describe what they were feeling. As this pandemic intensified and drug on, people began to express a sense of dryness, lack of energy, a sense of emptiness. Now, you might say that sounds a lot like depression, except clinically speaking, depression involves a diagnosis and an underlying disease. But this was not the presence of something, but more like the absence of something. Not the presence of disease, more like the absence of hopefulness or energy or feeling. In other words, it wasn't that people felt sick, it was they didn't feel much at all. Now, you might relate to that sense of languishing. And we could talk about all the reasons, the loss of our rhythms and our routines, the stress and making decisions, the threat of getting sick or dying. But the bottom line is the pandemic left a hole in our lives and in our society. And that is a way to describe the void that is left after something this traumatic. It has exposed parts of our lives and parts of our world that are empty of any real life. It has left a corporate and personal void. Now, many of us have this burning desire to rush back to normal, to refill that void with what we knew from before, what is comfortable, what is known. But deep down, if we'll, if we'll listen to God speaking into our hearts, we are also keenly aware and growing in our realization that we can't go back. And so today I wanna to suggest an alternative to getting back to our old lives. And instead, we need to get on with our new ones. We don't need what we had We need what God has now for us. We need something new, new life, new vitality, renewed relationship with God and with one another and renewed hope. We need to fill the void with what God is offering us in this very moment. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It is the day the church celebrates God's spirit pouring into the void to create something new on the face of the planet. The New Testament church was formed in the aftermath of the crucifixion of Jesus in the hope of resurrection, but in that space where it is hard to know what was coming next. In the disaster of Roman occupation and in the possibility of what might happen in the world that was forming. It was born in the longing for a savior, in the desire for liberation, in the soul deep need for salvation, for the need for communal restoration, and for the world to be shaped in a more loving way. It is into this void that on Pentecost, we hear the sound of a mighty wind coming in as the Spirit of God rushed in to fill that void. Genesis, at the beginning of the story, has a name for that void. Present before the creation of the world, it is my favorite Hebrew phrase, actually, tohu wavohu, the spirit of God is hovering over the waters and the earth, Genesis says, was formless and void. This dynamic from creation on plays out in our world. The spirit hovering over the voids in our lives and in our world waiting to rush in. That word for void in Genesis is sometimes thought to be the word chaos. And sometimes we tell the story that the spirit hovered over the chaos and then God brought order. And that's certainly true. But if we drill down to it, even chaos is too organized a concept for this word. Tohu wavohu is best understood as nothingness. 
formlessness, emptiness. It is the creation itself languishing. And it is into that space that again, God rushed in. God's spirit or God's breath, the very breath of God. They're the same word in Hebrew. So God breathes life into all that is. The word for spirit is thought to be the sound of breath. In this case, the breath of God, ruach, ruach. The idea is that we breathe in and we breathe out because the breath of God is in our lungs. In, it is the life force in the void that is inside of us, that space that is created for life in our lungs, this divine energy that fills that space inside of us. So take a deep breath. Now breathe out. Take a deeper breath. And imagine you're an ancient person trying to understand what that was really about, what was really happening, not knowing the science of it. As you breathe in again, imagine that all you understood is that the breath of God was coming in to sustain you, to fill the space inside of you and to give you life. They were pretty right, weren't they? They, they, they got it a lot right, not knowing the science. They got the idea down pat. And if we don't have that life coming inside of us, what happens? We are dry, we are empty, we are dead. The prophet Ezekiel expresses this dry emptiness of the entire people of Israel in exile. Once again, there is a void. It is left and in, in response to the worst thing that had ever happened to them, the loss of everything that they had known that was familiar to them. This is what Ezekiel says of the entire nation of Israel, the people of God. I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. This is a vision. Bones that were very dry. And God asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Ezekiel preaches to the nation in exile, which was the worst thing that had ever happened to them at a time when everything good lay in ruins, their land, their temple, their monarchy, the lives of their family and friends, the promises that they had bought into from God and therefore their hope where there had been a sense of divine providence and direction, now only an empty set of questions remained. The people were languishing. Ezekiel recognized the valley of dry bones. Yeah, he says, that is my people. So God tells Ezekiel to speak life into the dry bones, to call forth a new possibility. For Ezekiel, that meant to prophesy. It's not a word we use a lot, but in this sense, it means to speak God's limitless possibility. Ancient people actually knew what we have forgotten, that words have power. So God commands Ezekiel to utter a word. It is remarkably consistent with the Genesis story, the spirit of God over the, the formless tohu wavohu void, God speaks and creation happens. And so just in, as in that creation moment, Ezekiel speaks over the bones and suddenly there is a noise, a rattling as the bones start to come together, bones connecting to their corresponding bones, then sinew and flesh and skin covering the bones. But there was still no breath in them. To have life, they needed the spirit of God, the breath of God, the ruach to fill them. So God has Ezekiel speak God's limitless possibility over them a second time. Ezekiel does. He speaks calling for the four winds, God's breath to come in from literally every direction to come into the languishing of the people so that the people might live. And the breath came into them and they came to life and they stood up a vast multitude. And God says, I will put my spirit within you and you 
will live. Pentecost offers a similar vision. Our post-Pentecostal reality means this same life-giving spirit, the very breath of God is ours. The same spirit that hovered over the formless void, the same spirit that brings life to the dry bones, the same spirit now rushes in to fill the voids of our languishing. The spirit of God moving in for newness and possibility, the very things that we long for. The early church understood this to be so dramatic that it was understood as a new creation. The spirit was doing something every bit as creative and new and cosmic and powerful as that first word spoken over the creation, speaking worlds into existence. On Pentecost, there was a sound like a rushing wind, not because God is leaving the world as we might sometimes sense, but the spirit of God rushing in because that is what God does. Pentecost is the Christmas of the spirit. On Christmas, God is incarnate, right? In the flesh. On Pentecost, God is in Ruach, in the breath. The church is founded in this recognition that God is rushing in to our world to make things new, to make you new, breathing life into what otherwise is empty void. God is rushing in to breathe life into every empty space. As Robert Banks has written, this newness is what we really long for. What we desire is not an escape from the reality that we're in, nor is it merely an aid to handling reality. What we long for is newness and life as our reality. Through the work of the Spirit, the the possibility God has in store for us can enter into our present experience and into our current events. As it is written, what no eye has seen what no ear has heard, nor the heart of man conceived. This is what God has prepared for those who loved him and has revealed to us through the Spirit. The ability to see what no eye has seen, to hear what no ear has heard, to conceive what no one has thought of, is always been the church's spiritual hallmark. It allows us to walk in step with God. It allows us to see where God is at work and join him. It allows us to participate in the life of God here and now. In this way, walking by the spirit is the opposite of longing for the past. The biggest challenge for the church today in this moment is is that desire to get back to the things we knew. And it's hard to know for me as a pastor of a church, what do we continue doing and what do we no longer do? What do we need to get back to and what do we need to be open to in newness? And truthfully, the more things that were good for us individually or together, the more things that were good for us before, we're probably in greater danger of just longing to get back to the past. We might not have the urgency to change at the pace the world is changing. We might not have the spiritual longing to look to see what God is doing in this moment. Todd Bolsinger has written that familiar and family are the same root. In other words, it's easy for us to cling to nostalgia, to subvert our deep longing for God and trade it in for a longing for the past, for the comfort of home. One of our biggest concerns ought to be that we will waste this crisis, demanding to go home, demanding our way, demanding what is comfortable rather than asking God to fill the void with something new. My impulse as a pastor is to make sure the church survives this topsy-turvy time. But the truth is nobody in the community cares if our institution exists, but they do care if we care about them and they do care whether we are those who can see and speak God's limitless possibility. And that happens only by the Spirit only by an openness to God rushing in yet again. On this Pentecost, I ask you to imagine the spirit of God making the dry bones of this world alive again. 
And in that spirit, we asked some of our community partners what we need to know about the dry bones that they're seeing, about the need for God's limitless possibility that had been revealed in this time, in this pandemic. And as you know, many of our partners work with children and you're gonna hear that. And so we asked, what is one reality in our local community that you are dealing with in your work that people really need to know about? We heard from the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Home and, and they wrote, child abuse and neglect is more prevalent in our communities than we realize. Kentucky has had the highest rate of child abuse and neglect in the nation. In 2019, one in 50 Kentucky children were victims of abuse or neglect. I want you to imagine with me the spirit of God rushing into that reality and us following God into relationships and patterns of being and hopes and dreams and systems and programs and commitments to changing that reality. Kentucky United Methodist Children's Home also talks about the the foster care system and how it's tremendously overburdened with children who need a safe home to rebuild their lives and heal their broken hearts. And so they write to us, our hope is that every child will know that they are a person of worth and a child of God. We heard from the foundry and Dr. Daniels at the foundry said, I think the mindset of short-term survival continues for people in our community. So many families are battling so many problems that they can't give much time to building more promising lives. He continues, I believe many may know Jesus is their way, but their patience may wane under the pressure of multiple problems. I believe people in our community need more consistent doses of hope, he says, encouragement and progressive support. We heard from our longtime partner, T.C. Cherry. We've been mentoring in T.C. Cherry School for 13 years. And this is what we heard I think the one reality I would want people to know about is that the home life of many of our students, what they're dealing with, I think so many times we are wanting to get them an education, but more and more it is becoming a regular thing at school that in my position especially, we're seeing and trying to take care of home issues. These kids are dealing with poverty and drug abuse and just so many things more now than ever. School is a safe place for these kids. It is where they feel safe and where they can actually come to be kids. This does go back to our mentoring program that we want to get up going again. Uh, T.C. Cherry is on board with us as soon as we're able. These kids so desperately need love and attention and a positive role model in their lives. This is the question Ezekiel is posed with from God himself. And you notice that God is the one who asks, can these bones live? And I wonder if God might be asking us, can we look around at the dry bones and see what no other eye has seen, to hear what other ears aren't going to hear, to conceive what no one else will think of? And what about our own languishing, our own sense of emptiness, the way in some way or another this pandemic has revealed a hole in us, a vague sense that our, life, our lives are meant for something more than just getting back to the way things were? What about us envisioning and listening for and conceiving an even fuller thing? Maybe a less hectic schedule, maybe a less materialistic driven existence, maybe more time in God's creation, maybe more time in God's presence, more, maybe a more God-full life where God's presence seeps into even the most mundane of our activities. Maybe it's more time of prayer and celebration and joy, inviting God into every aspect of our lives. What would it be like to find joy in unexpected places? What would it be like to hold out for God to speak before we rush back to the activities that we were doing before. And I don't know about you, but my family, many of us are already being pulled right back into so many of the things that have kept us busy. 
what if we were intentional and uh, worked together to build new rhythms of flourishing in our lives with the goal of a fuller participation in the life of God now, a fuller engagement in the things of God to fill whatever languishing that is in us with God's flourishing. Next week, we will celebrate some of the signs of this new life through the church. We're going to dream about practical ways and give a practical example of how even in this time, God has been doing a new thing. That'll be next week. But today, I simply want to speak God's limitless possibility over you. My guess is that there is some void in your life that needs filling. And in this moment, I invite you to call for something new, to ask God to, to fill that void, to call for something new, not our old life, but our new life in Christ. John Wesley wrote of this vision in his essay, New Birth, back in the 1700s. And he describes this moment when God's spirit rushes into the void of our lives. And so as we close, I'd like to adapt these words and speak them over you. May the eyes of your understanding be opened. May you see the light of the glory of God, his glorious love in the face of Jesus Christ. May your ears being now opened make you capable of hearing the inward voice of God saying, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Go and sin no more. May you feel in your heart, to use the language of our church, the mighty working of the spirit of God. May you many times feel such joy in God as is unspeakable and full of glory. May you feel the love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit which is given you. May you daily increase in the knowledge of God, of Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And now may you be properly said to live. God having quickened you by his spirit made you alive to God through Jesus Christ. May you live a life which is hidden with Christ and God, God continually breathing as it were into your soul and your soul breathing God. May grace descend in your heart and prayer and praise ascend to heaven. And by this intercourse between God and humanity, this fellowship with the Father and the Son be a kind of spiritual respiration sustaining the life of God in your soul and you as a child of God growing up till you come to the full measure of the fullness of Christ. From that point, may you experience what could only be called a new birth, this great change which God works in us, works in our souls when he brings our souls to life. Amen.